Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Asian Impact Webinar from the Asian Development Bank. Today's topic is promoting healthy and active aging, which is a very important policy agenda for many developing countries of Asia. In this connection, high income countries at advanced stages of the aging process have plenty of experiences which are relevant for developing Asia. For example, the international comparative evidence on old age social security and pension programs across advanced economies offers valuable lessons for the region in protecting the elderly from poverty and economic insecurity. More specifically, in today's webinar, we will discuss the comparative evidence on, on old age security and pension programs across advanced countries. Second, share key lessons learned in planning and implementing comparative research programs across different countries and regions. And third, we will explore opportunities and challenges in promoting comparative research on population aging in the Asia Pacific region. This Asian Impact Webinar is part of the Regional Conference on Health and Socioeconomic Wellbeing of Older Persons in Asia that started today and runs until 9 September. For those who are interested in joining the conference tomorrow and Thursday, we will share the conference website and registration details in the chat box. So please feel free to register and join us for the next two days. I will kick off this webinar with a few questions after the presentation but we would, would like to hear from you, our audience. For those joining from Zoom, please type in your questions in the Q&A box on your screen. And please do, give, please do give thumbs up or like to existing questions. And we will address the most popular questions first. We also welcome our LinkedIn audience and we are doing LinkedIn for the first time. And we encourage you to leave questions and comments in the uh, comments section in the LinkedIn uh, uh, screen. To have this uh, important webinar, we have the privilege of having one distinguished keynote speaker and three distinguished panelists. They are, Professor Axel Borsch Supan, who is a director of the Max Planck Institute for Social Law and Social Policy in Munich. He is also a professor at the Technical University of Munich and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Professor Borsch Supan has a PhD in economics from MIT, and he is a world-class authority on population aging. Now, for our three distinguished panelists, we have Professor Datuk Norma Mansur, who is the Director of Social Wellbeing Research Center, or SWRC, at the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Professor Norma Mansur has a PhD from uh, University of Liverpool in the UK. We also have Director Maliki from the Ministry of uh, National Development Planning in Indonesia. He has been working in uh, Bapenas for more than 20 years, and he has a PhD from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And the third panelist, last but not least, we have our colleague, uh, Dr. Aiko Kikawa, who is an economist uh, at ADB's Economic Research Department. So without further ado, 
let me uh, pass the floor to Professor Axel Bors-Supan. Over to you, Professor. Thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction. Good afternoon to everybody. Um, for me, it's early morning. Uh, I will speak about the uh, art of meaningful international comparisons uh, in population aging research. Uh, and I will make uh, three main points. Uh, one is uh, the chances uh, and obviously also the challenges uh, of international comparisons. Um, in particular, uh, how different countries are, even within a region, uh, the differences are uh, really fascinating. Uh, the second, I, I will talk a little bit about data, but very short. Uh, and then the final point, uh, I think, which, which is important, uh, is learning lessons from the uh, NBER's International Social Security Project, which Tom already mentioned, which is the art of actually distilling a message from, from all this big data which you have seen and the many messages uh, which seem to be in the, uh, in the data. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I know very little about Asia. So what you have actually have to do is translate uh, what uh, I will present about Europe uh, into, into Asia. Uh, and you see this picture, that, that is really what I call the fascination of heterogeneity. France is so different from Germany, so different from Spain, uh, not to speak about the very north and the very south. Uh, and you have similar big differences uh, within Asia. Uh, so you have to do the translation work from uh, Europe to, to Asia. Um, <clears throat> let me actually start with population aging, uh, already pointing out the big differences. Uh, to the right, you see the Mediterranean countries and Japan. Uh, these are the oldest old countries, if I may say so. Um, and the rela relation between uh, the uh, young population and the old population is about 80 to 100, almost one to one. It's a huge contrast to the countries to the left. Uh, like the Anglo-Saxon countries or the, uh, the, uh, the Scandinavian countries, where this ratio is 40 to, to, uh, to 100. Um, so there's much more, more economic power, so to speak, uh, in the uh, countries which are marked green uh, than, uh, than the grayish countries. If you dig a little bit deeper, and this is where, where uh, international comparisons uh, are actually interesting, then uh, uh, at least for Europe, you see a clear pattern uh, already very early in the development of demography. You have some countries, the, the uh, Germany, Netherlands, Austria, Belgium, uh, who had a huge baby boom, a very short baby boom actually, but a huge one. And this completely dominates demographics. Uh, then you have countries uh, which for a long time had low fertility, uh, but already a very long uh, uh, lifetime, longer than in other countries. These are the Mediterranean countries, and they, they have this uh, very, very large proportion of older people in their countries. But even within Europe, you have uh, countries which are completely different, like France, we look more like the uh, United States, uh, Sweden and Denmark, uh, which still have uh, relatively uh, high current fertility, higher than in many, many Asian countries, uh, particularly Korea and, uh, and Japan. Uh, so if you dig deeper, you, uh, you, you find that lots of the differences, the heterogeneity in countries is actually historical. Uh, and I think that that is the first uh, very important lesson for international comparison. Never forget the history of, uh, of each countries. They are all different and they have to be appreciated. Another thing uh, where, where, where international data, uh, international comparison are very helpful is uh, that they're simply necessary to understand what is going on. Uh, there's the famous lump of labor fallacy, which tells you uh, very important in pension economics uh, that some people think, and this is the uh, red line here, uh, that if you send people early into retirement, uh, you will create low unemployment for the younger. Um, so the, the, the popular version is uh, the older take the, uh, the jobs away from the young. This is just plain wrong. Uh, and it's important to, to point this out over and again. And you can see this easily in international data, uh, where uh, here are the, uh, the uh, countries of the International Social Security Project. And you see, in effect, it's exactly the opposite. Uh, you have uh, uh, countries in which you have high youth unemployment and uh, early retirement and not the other way around. 
Now, even more subtle, uh, where uh, international data is very, very uh, helpful, is to use it as instruments. Now, the example I want to show, again, is important for pension economics. There is the belief that uh, uh, older people lose cognition fairly early, uh, and they're actually rather unproductive. Uh, uh, so it's better to send them uh, into retirement early. Um, if you look at the data, uh, you see the opposite. Um, it's actually an astounding finding. Uh, you see on the horizontal axis uh, a measure of uh, cognitive abilities, actually the, the, the ability to, to remember words. Uh, and on the horizontal axis, you see the percent not working anymore, already retired. Uh, this is for people 60 and over. Um, and you see that in countries where, where people retire early, cognition is also low and the other way around. Now, the big question is, where is the causality? It's obvious that uh, if people are not, not on their, not cognitively able anymore, if they forget everything, uh, the boss will actually throw them out sooner or later. Um, but that is not the interesting causality. The interesting causality is the other way around. Uh, does early retirement make people well, sit on the couch, don't do anything anymore, uh, and they lose their cognitive abilities. And to find that out, uh, it is actually very helpful to have international data because you can uh, use them as econometric instruments and uh, what uh, and sort of resolve uh, the hen and the egg problem here uh, and really distinguish the causes and the effects. And what we find out um, using international variation early retirement rules, uh, so we're just replacing uh, that the people decide not to work anymore by their ability to work not anymore. This is exogenous, this is endogenous in our language. Uh, and you see that the same kind of negative relation holds, uh, but now it's clearly the causality uh, that if people retire early, uh, take advantage of uh, early public pension benefits, uh, they actually lose cognitive abilities uh, because they don't use their brain anymore. Uh, so that, that's a very nice but complicated example uh, where evidence is only possible because you have international variation and can do international uh, comparisons. The effects of COVID are a similar uh, example. Uh, this is the share of households uh, which uh, uh, have lost uh, more than 10% of their income during the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, again, this is the European Union. You see that on average, it's about 22%, quite large actually. Um, but you see a huge difference uh, between the Nordic countries and the very left, uh, the central countries. Uh, and the Mediterranean countries to the right. Now, the interesting question is why so? And again, international comparison lets you uh, distinguish between job losses due to the pandemic severity uh, measured here in reported cases of COVID per 100,000 of population versus the stringency of the lockdown measures. Uh, and uh, we use an index uh, where you just count the numbers of uh, very high stringency. And you see uh, that the pandemic has only has actually a negative uh, uh, effect on uh, on uh, income losses uh, in households, whereas uh, there is a strict uh, positive and significant correlation uh, between lockdown stringency and income effects, uh, which tells you that the secondary effect is actually larger than the primary effect of the uh, epidemic. A final uh, example uh, is uh, actually also astounding. I was interested in the effects of health expenditures on health. Now, most survey data have a uh, uh, subject, uh, subjective question of health. Uh, usually they let the uh, people rate their health from poor to excellent. And if you do this in, uh, in the European countries, uh, in this little graph, then uh, you're very disappointed because you see no correlation whatsoever. Uh, um, <clears throat> uh, I also like to pick out uh, two countries here. DK is Denmark uh, and DE is Germany. If you look at that data, uh, you see that uh, Denmark uh, has a fairly high percentage of uh, very good health and Germany a lousy percentage of uh, health. 
And that seems to be correlated negatively, uh, negatively uh, with the health expenditures uh, in the country. A very bad message, right? But, uh, and this gets me to the pitfalls of international comparison. It's the bad measurement here. People, uh, 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 the, the, the subjective measurements of health are simply not reliable. Uh, they're very much depending on uh, people's mood, for example. The Danes are well known to be optimistic. The Germans, like me, uh, are well known to be rather pessimistic. There are exceptions, though. Um, <clears throat> so what we do is actually, uh, uh, in the data, uh, we use uh, more objective measurements of health, very complicated, uh, grip strength, the waist circumference, the, uh, the uh, blood pressure, uh, uh, we actually take blood, we let them walk, uh, and all these kind of things. And we see that the Germans indeed, this is the uh, picture to the left, are underrating their health uh, uh, while the Danes are overrating their health. On the subjective scale, Germany and Denmark are actually very far apart. But if you look at the objective, then they're very close to each other. So it's all subjective, very biased, uh, which tells you that you, you really got to be careful in international comparison what you actually measure. Some of these uh, items are, uh, they just work differently in different countries. Now, if you use the objective measure for the question at, at hand, this is the right-hand side picture, you actually see there is a positive correlation uh, between health expenditures uh, and health, objectively measured. Um, and uh, uh, this is the correct interpretation. And you see that it's actually worth uh, spending money on, uh, on better health. So this was a fairly broad range of... Uh, examples where international comparisons are actually very, very helpful uh, to understand what is going on. Obviously, as you already saw in, uh, in, my, um, in, in my last example about health, you do need good data. And this um, gets, gets me to the second point. Um, <clears throat> you, 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 you need data which is uh, harmonized sufficiently. And this is really a... Uh, um, a, quite a challenge. In Europe, the European Union has sponsored a data set which is called SHARE, um, and uh, I will spend a little bit time on uh, explaining what this data does uh, to actually um, help uh, making international comparisons. Um, so SHARE is the survey of health, aging, and retirement in Europe. Um, it is in, in existence now uh, more than 15 years. Um, it's a fairly large sample uh, of um, uh, 140,000 respondents, uh, age 50 plus. Um, by now, we have uh, nine waves of data, um, including one, uh, two uh, telephone waves uh, in, uh, during the COVID times. Uh, we have um, almost half a million of interviews uh, in 28 countries, uh, just across the European Union. You see that the UK is missing, uh, uh, as you know. Um, the interesting thing in, uh, in chair, and this gets me back to the importance of, um, of thinking about the history of countries, um, is uh, we, we not only collect data, current data of the people, but we also ask them about their life histories. Uh, and some people are quite old in our sample. Uh, we have, uh, I think the oldest is 103 years old. Um, so this person um, uh, has been born uh, uh, before uh, or during um, World War I. Uh, quite a quite a time about, uh, ago, and we learn a lot about uh, the history of these different countries uh, just by asking questions: uh, what happened in their youth. Uh, we also collect blood uh, for like these objective health measures we were talking about. Now, this is obviously a luxury situation for Europe uh, that we have such a data. Um, the uh, the data is harmonized uh, in a global network, and that includes quite a few Asian countries. Um, uh, very early on, Korea, uh, later Japan, uh, then China. Uh, we now also have um, 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 related um, service in India, Indonesia, 
Um, but, uh, uh, and I think um, Norma uh, in Malaysia, we have soon data as well. So we are, we are a growing family, um, but uh, it seems to be very important to remember that data has to be harmonized to actually make meaningful comparisons. Um, uh, it's anti-harmonized. Uh, I mean that you ask similar questions uh, about similar kind of circumstances to the people so you can actually compare things and you don't create artifacts uh, because uh, the questions were only approximately similar. Uh, then uh, the difference in the question obviously generates differences in the answers which screw up the, uh, the evidence. Um, these surveys uh, have... Uh, uh, quite a, a broad range of questions. Uh, they give, uh, this is a mouthful, uh, really a transdisciplinary picture of human life uh, all across the globe. Um, they uh, look at the health of the people, the social environment of the people and the economic situation. Uh, and that is very important because they're closely related. We know that the people who are poor very often also have bad health. And they, unfortunately, also very often live in social, uh, uh, in difficult social situation, uh, like uh, uh, divorced uh, uh, and uh, isolated, uh, particularly when they are older. Um, so I think it's very important uh, uh, if you think about population aging, uh, think um, um, uh, interdisciplinary uh, or even transdisciplinary. Um, um, so uh, typically these aging surveys have a very broad range of questions, measurements uh, like uh, from blood uh, and tests like on cognition. Um, I don't want to go into detail here. Uh, socioeconomic status is obvious, you need labor force participation, but also income and wealth. Uh, wealth is important because that's where the big differences are. Uh, a lot of health data, subjective and objective health. Uh, um, we are actually uh, uh, using all kinds of biomarkers uh, in our data, um, the very sophisticated uh, measurements of health, but also health behaviors like uh, smoking, uh, whether you have health insurance uh, um, and whether you actually go to the doctor, uh, whether you have the ability to go to the doctor. Again, that's very important in many parts of, uh, of Asia. And finally, social participation. Uh, which is not confined to the family, but uh, also to the wider environment. Uh, okay, um, <clears throat> the uh, the final thing which is important for for international comparison is uh, to, uh, which I stressed earlier um, is to really think about the institutional context. Countries are so different, um, uh, even neighboring countries. Uh, and uh, so the institutional context has to be measured somehow. Uh, the OECD does a good job in, uh, in, in, in providing data, uh, but very often you have to help yourself. Um, and in SHARE, we have a database which is called SPLASH, a social policy um, <clears throat> archive for the SHARE data. Um, and this collects welfare state policies uh, like when is the retirement age, when is early retirement, when is late retirement. Uh, what is the replacement rate of pension system and all these kind of uh, institutional parameters, uh, which are important to understand how uh, pension systems work. The same for health, the same for long-term care. So it's a large database. This brings me to the uh, last point, um, which is, uh, now this was definitely too fast. Um, Okay, um, which is the art of uh, distilling a message, a clearly defined message. Um, and I use it as an example, the uh, NBR, International Social Security Project, the ADB was particularly interested uh, in uh, having me talking about this. Um, so what we observe um, uh, is uh, the following picture. Um, we see a striking reversal of labor force participation among older workers. Um, now, this um, you have to look at the small numbers here. Uh, in the 1980s uh, till about the, the year 2000, labor force participation was free falling. Uh, these are men and women uh, age 50, no, age 60 to, to, to 65. Um, ever fewer uh, people were working and they were ever earlier going into early retirement. Now, miraculously, quote unquote, miraculously, 
this uh, th there was a trend reversal, uh, and uh, now we are not back to the 1980s. Uh, uh, actually, in some countries we are, like in Germany, um, but uh, there, there is a striking reversal. And with women, it's a little bit more complicated because we have a secular trend for more female labor force participation. But even there, you see that it was rather flat or in some countries slightly down, and now it's going up for, for, uh, uh, for all countries. So something has happened around the uh, uh, turn of the century uh, in the late 90s. And uh, the interesting question of uh, the NBR International Social Security Project was uh, how much of the labor force trends can be explained by the changing incentives uh, of social security policy um, of the labor market and pension uh, reforms which have happened in the, in the 90s. Now that is not an easy question to ask uh, because there's so many other things to go uh, which have going been going on uh, during during that time in Europe, Canada, uh, the United States, and Japan. Um, so uh, what we did is uh, very very structured. Uh, um, take a sample of uh, twelve countries. You see them here. Um, and uh, monitor which reforms have actually taken place. Um, so we used a, a precise structural um, uh, setup uh, to verbally describe these reforms um, using the same language. This doesn't mean English. Uh, this used the, the, the same economic expressions and the same mathematical terms, actually. Um, and in Germany, uh, just as an example, uh, we have six uh, reforms uh, between 1992 and uh, just recently one more. Uh, which changed the uh, the um, the pension system in Germany and other countries uh, similar. We translated these verbal descriptions in quantitative policy parameters, uh, like the earliest uh, eligibility age for pension, the normal eligibility age, uh, the uh, for rate age, the actual adjustment, the replacement rate, and so forth, um, and uh, stratified them by uh, by population strata. Uh, and sectors, um, and uh, then, and that is, I think, the art of really condensing the message. We found one indicator, uh, which we really liked uh, to condense all the, the complications of the pension laws, uh, and this is uh, the what we call the implicit tax on con continuing work. This is the, the difference in the, um, in the value of your pensions over the rest of your life, what is usually called social security wealth. Um, this is uh, in the language here, uh, how your social security wealth changes if you postpone your retirement by one year. So this is the loss in pension payments uh, if you work one year longer. And this should be offset uh, by a higher pension uh, for the rest of, the, um, uh, of uh, your life um, if the system is actually fair which most of the systems are not. So we, we, we compute this statistic, we relate the difference in social security wealth to the current income, and what we see is a huge mess of data. So these are all the countries uh, we have. Uh, and you see, if you, if you look closely at the pictures, you see a trend uh, that this implicit tax uh, actually gets lower, but it's a mess of data. And this is what I mean uh, with the art of distilling a message. Uh, uh, if you start with the International uh, Social Security Project or international comparison in general, usually the data is fairly messy because the countries are so different. But if you look closer um, and use some econometrics, then actually uh, uh, you see that uh, um, the, um, uh, this implicit, uh, implicit tax has declined. Uh, and if you relate it to the average employment rate, you actually get a very nice picture. Um, you, 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 you see the, uh, uh, if you go back to the, uh, to the 1980s, uh, how the, um, the implicit tax, the financial loss when postponing retirement, first increases and then decreases. And this exactly matches uh, the pattern of the average employment rate, which first decreased and then increased again. So the art here was really to use a complicated uh, uh, concept uh, uh, 
uh, use comparable data, uh, and then uh, distill a message, which is quite clear. Um, if the pension systems uh, create a financial loss when you actually work longer, these pension systems make a big mistake. Uh, they do not reward working longer, but they actually punish working longer. And this is exactly what you see. Um, uh, if the punishment is high, work workers work little. Uh, if the punishment uh, gets lower, then they work more. Okay. So um, I think my, my, my time is over. I don't want to go into, into details here. Uh, let me just summarize that uh, international comparisons are just very, very fascinating because you'll learn so much about the countries. Uh, there are chances, uh, and I, I spent quite a, quite a few examples uh, to show you, but there are also challenges of international comparison. You need good data uh, and you need to, to, to have a clear strategy. Uh, how to distill a message uh, of the data. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank <clears throat> you so much, Professor Borsch Supan. Of course, this kind of international comparisons are hugely beneficial because countries do want to benchmark themselves against other countries. But I think, uh, as you point out, they're also immensely challenging, even for Europe, which we generally view as much, uh, much uh, more homogeneous or much less heterogeneous than Asia, we saw that there were significant challenges between, an, for example, an optimistic Denmark or optimistic Danes, more precisely, and the pessimistic Germany or more pes pessimistic uh, Germans. So I think the challenges in the Asian context uh, must be that much greater. Now, I'm sure the audience uh, has uh, many questions for you, uh, Professor, but let's first uh, proceed to the panel and then we'll uh, have a Q&A session for the speaker, for you, Professor, as well as the three panelists at the very end of our webinar. So let's, uh, without further ado, Let's proceed to the panel, panel session part of the webinar. Uh, again, the three panelists are Dr. Maliki from Papenas in Indonesia, Professor Norma from University of uh, Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and our colleague, uh, Dr. Aiko Takenaka. So let me begin with, uh, with a question for Director Maliki of Papenas from Indonesia. So, Pak Maliki, please share with us some basic information about the ongoing survey and research work led by Papenas. And I'm sure you play a major leadership role there. What are the top priority policy agenda in your country in this area? And how do your data and research feed into the evidence-based policy-making process? Uh, over to you, Director Maliki. Okay, thank you, Mr. Park. Also, uh, Professor Axel, uh, thank you for your fascinating uh, presentations. Uh, all the figures are very interesting, as well as uh, the ownership of the data in uh, the along uh, the European continent. I guess that one is very which and I really envy because uh, I think if we have uh, such uh, comprehensive data in our country, also we can have more uh, comprehensive analysis uh, on the uh, condition of our aging population. So in Indonesia itself, uh, I guess uh, we are actually maybe the, young, uh, the youngest uh, uh, countries uh, around uh, our regions, because I think we are uh, younger than Malaysia, also of of course Thailand, and also uh, a, a bit slightly uh, maybe uh, older than Manila, uh, the Philippines. But uh, we are uh, facing uh, aging population starting from uh, 2019, 2020, when we have like 10 percent of our populations aged six, uh, 60, uh, around 10 percent. And it will increase into 25% in 2045. Uh, the, 
uh, the challenge is that it's not on percentage, but in terms of the amount or uh, the numbers, as well as the diversity among the provinces and also regions. So we have quite diverse uh, populations uh, and very different from the west, western part of Indonesia as well as the eastern part of Indonesia because the phenomena of aging uh, now is only maybe starting from Java, but even in eastern part of Indonesia is still quite young with TFR is higher than three, uh, three uh, per, uh, uh, per women. So this is uh, one uh, challenge for us. Uh, in terms of how we can understand of the elderly itself, we are just beginning, uh, uh, Mr. Park, because uh, you know that we try to uh, to really understand how actually these aging populations happened and also how actually the characters of the elderly uh, in Indonesia uh, will shape our uh, policy in the future. So uh, this is one thing. And then the, the second thing is that we try, uh, we also try to advocate uh, the uh, both central government, also the local government uh, on the importance, uh, the, uh, the important issue of the, uh, on this aging care. So uh, in terms of data, as well as the research, uh, we have uh, macro data such as SUSNAS that are also described on the socioeconomic conditions, the uh, support system of the elderly in Indonesia, uh, somehow health, system, uh, health uh, conditions of Indonesia. But uh, I think that one is, doesn't really uh, describe quite uh, uh, comprehensively, even that we can uh, we can see. Uh, the conditions uh, in uh, at the national level. So uh, Bapenas initiate uh, the uh, uh, one is like a, a, on the uh, the type of the socioeconomic registry on uh, elderly populations. We call it Silani, the information system of the uh, elderly. So we have uh, census uh, for the whole population of the elderly in some of the regions. So we only have uh, three provinces as our pilot project now and supported by UNAPA and also ADB. UNAPA supported us for the, uh, for the data uh, mining and then ADB also supported us for the, for the pilot, uh, the, flop, uh, the flopping for uh, the policy on how we can uh, uh, develop the system of the long-term care as well as the integrated uh, system, uh, integrated system of, of the policy for the uh, for the uh, elderly. So this data, well, we call it Silani, uh, actually is quite a comprehensive data consisting of socioeconomic condition, pension system, support system, psychological, and also long-term uh, that can actually uh, 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 drawing uh, the conditions of this uh, uh, elderly and then drawing the policy on how we can uh, uh, see the demand of the long-term care or, uh, or also the, uh, the active, uh, the, the in more integrated uh, programs for the active uh, elderly. So this, uh, the objective of the SILAN itself is that we, uh, we try to uh, uh, develop the socioeconomic ranking of the uh, the population of the elderly, as well as on how we can adopt also more adaptive social protections, uh, and then uh, we also try to connect uh, this uh, data, uh, uh, these conditions into the uh, necessary uh, uh, health as well as the psychological uh, services. Uh, that is provided by the both uh, on the government, also the non-local uh, government. So actually, uh, the Silani also is like encouraging uh, the uh, effectiveness and also accelerations of the poverty reductions and outreach the most uh, vulnerable groups and residents in outermost and also underdeveloped and also frontier area. So the, the most uh, actually uh, very uh, useful features of uh, Silan is that we can identify identify the conditions of the elderly uh, by some of the uh, variables that we have. We can uh, also identify who actually uh, the elderly 
in the regions or uh, in the pilot uh, pro, uh, in the pilot regions uh, is uh, needing for says like the long term care uh, that have a conditions on ADL or also the instrument uh, ADL as well as the conditions of uh, 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 mental uh, instability or depressions uh, and also disability as well as the uh, dementia. So based on this uh, based on these conditions. We actually can uh, match them uh, with the uh, with the services of uh, says like LTC needed, or whether this uh, with whether this uh, uh, elderly needs like long term care, or even if uh, it is like in the border between the L, uh, between the LTC and non LTC uh, needed is then we can have a uh, prevention programs that this elderly is uh, condition is not deteriorated. And moreover, actually, when I look at the graph of uh, Professor Axel, is that there is like a reverse labor uh, participation condition uh, in Europe. Actually, that one is also one of our objective on how we can increase the uh, labor participations of the elderly in Indonesia by providing them actually with the skills, with the uh, with the employment opportunity around uh, around the community, so then they can have something. Uh, they have can uh, they can have like an activity, yeah. so then uh, they will uh, have more uh, fit conditions. So uh, that is actually the the, the whole uh, uh, initiatives that uh, uh, we uh, Bapenas already uh, uh, start uh, supported by ADB, as well as that actually we coordinate also with the line ministers such as Minister of Health, Minister of Social Affairs, and also Family Planning. In addition to that, actually, Bapenas also uh, initiate uh, a lot of uh, like uh, uh, evidence-based research, uh, and also we write, uh, write about uh, uh, write about uh, write a book about the uh, the elderly conditions in Indonesia, and this one is also uh, quite uh, uh, have a lot of contributions, not only from the government side but also from the non-government sides. All the expert, all the uh, what we call. Uh, those who actually had a lot of uh, pay, pay attention on uh, the uh, policy development uh, of the elderly in Indonesia. So this is quite interesting, actually, uh, on how we can uh, draw uh, the policy based on the, uh, the data. And we also try to understand how actually this, the, uh, the diversity conditions around Indonesia that can be supported by more adaptive uh, policy on, uh, on the elderly. I think uh, that's all. Thank you so much, uh, Park Maliki. Uh, it seems there's a great, tremendous, in fact, amount of heterogeneity in terms of population aging within a highly diverse and vast, huge country such as uh, Indonesia. Now I turn to Professor Norma Mansur, who comes from a more middle-sized country, Malaysia, and this is my question for you, Professor Norma Mansur. Your institution, Social Wellbeing Research Center, implements MARS or the Malaysian Aging and Retirement Survey. How do the results of that survey feed into policy making process? Uh, please uh, tell us with some degree of precision. And should other Asian countries consider implementing similar surveys, surveys similar to Mars? Over to you, Professor Norma. Thank you, Dr. Park. Um, very good, good afternoon to all, and, and thank you to the ADB for, for having, me, uh, having me here. Um, when I joined the Social Wellbeing Research Center in 2013, um, we are tasked uh, um, is to um, uh, recommend to the Employees Provident Fund, who's our um, our endowment uh, uh, endower, who, who provided the endowment fund to the university, to research on the old age financial protection, and um, and we realized that we we had no data, we had no data to support whatever recommendations that we we had to to do or to 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 work on, yeah. And that was when, because there is no uh, micro uh, uh, database in Malaysia, we have the household income survey, household income expenditure survey, just like Indonesia, but 
Um, this is on the household, and it's not it's not the same household that is followed through. Yeah, so there was a, a, a no micro longitudinal uh, uh, database. That's when we invited Professor Bosupan to come and talk to us. We were so impressed with Share and what how powerful Share is and can help governments to come up with policies and. Um, and I brought uh, Professor Bosupan to go and see um, a few departments, government departments in Malaysia, in order to convince them to, to have this micro uh, data, micro database. And it was tough because um, it, it, it requires a big fund uh, to, to conduct such survey. Uh, but finally, we, we were able to, um, we, since we received the support from the Employees Provident Fund, which is a pension fund in Malaysia, um, that they agreed that the fund could be used for the survey yeah, against the recommendation of Professor Bosupan and our shareholder then, Professor Robert Hoffman, not to do our own survey because it's going to be cost costly. But we conducted a pilot survey, and from the pilot survey, we convinced our, uh, our council members, who's mainly the Employees Provident Fund, to continue with the survey. So we conducted the first uh, um, Malaysia Aging Retirement Survey in 2018 and completed in 2019. And we received about uh, more than 5,000, close to 6,000 uh, um, respondents uh, throughout Malaysia. And um, we work with the Department of Statistics to get the randomized sampling so that it is represented, representative of the of Malaysians. Yeah. So um, not just uh, uh, for, for the Employees Provident Fund, um, SWRC sits in various committees, task force, and also councils at the, global, at the national level. So our findings have been um, shared with all these agencies um, and we did uh, um, in whatever recommendations or advocacy that we do with regards to the social protection, we have the evidence to, to support. So this is very powerful. And um, increasingly, uh, um, if I could just share, and I'm sure there are Malaysians among the audience as well. In 2013, 14, when I first joined this um, uh, center, uh, and also um, uh, within the university, we don't get much discussions on social protection, let, uh, let, let the, uh, uh, and especially on aging. Yeah? Um, and yet, four or five years since then, there are a lot of discussions in the, in the public domain, as well as this, uh, the government circles on aging uh, uh, population and on social protection. So I wouldn't want to claim that it all came from the Social Wellbeing Research Center. I mean, we have our partners. Our partners are the Employees Provident Fund, the Social Security Organization Malaysia, the Ministry of Finance, and also various other uh, um, ministries that work on social protection. But I must say that with our results and always talking about how Mars, for the first time, yeah, Malaysia has this kind of database, and currently, we are conduct conducting wave two of Malaysia Aging Retirement Survey. So you can trace you can trace the same individual over the years on their health and healthcare utilization, on their income and consumption, on family support and living arrangement, on work, employment and retirement, and also on psychosocial. We do collect biomarkers uh, as well, uh, uh, just like share but we do not collect the, the blood spot. Yeah? We, we, we check their blood pressures, we check the, um, their grip, yeah? and we also check on the cognitive uh, uh, abilities. So our data is comparable in, and, and we have harmonized uh, for the information of Professor Bosupan. Mars data is now fully harmonized with the Gateway to Global Aging uh, databases. So uh, comparisons can be made uh, um, between Malaysia and other countries that's uh, in the uh, uh, database. And so we have, uh, uh, we have to say that there were some interesting findings that were not in the existing databases in Malaysia. Yeah? For instance, in terms of health, the reported health cases as opposed to when we check, when, when our enumerators go and check their blood pressure, yeah? that it is an increase of 30%. So out there, 
the actual evidence shows that there are more people who has hypertension compared to what's reported or what you can get from the medical records. Yeah? And the other aspect, uh, there, there are a few interesting because there were five areas that we're looking at. And we found out that, and we're able to share this, we, we, we are featured in the main media uh, um, and also in the business media. Interestingly, in Malaysia, uh, we, we, as, we, as I said, we, we do not want to claim that it is from our advocacy, but I think it is also the general uh, multilateral organizations that's talking about the aging population. But we were featured in the edge, which is really a business uh, uh, media yeah, that talking about the uh, phenomenon of aging in Malaysia. And these were the found findings of Mars of the Malaysia Aging Retirement Survey. So Dr. Park, I think I'll stop there. This is as much as we are uh, um, our, 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 our uh, contribution to policy making in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Norma Mansur. I think uh, the Mars experience really shows the uh, high value, in, in fact, enormous value of uh, collecting high quality individual time series data, which allows uh, researchers to do meaningful and rigorous empirical analysis, which in turn can form the basis of solid evidence-based policy uh, making. Many thanks for that. Now I turn to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Aiko Takenaka. You're, uh, Dr. Aiko, you're leading a major ADB research program on population aging. In your opinion, how can multilateral development institu institutions such as ADB support developing economies in generating policy relevant data and policy relevant research? What are the most salient knowledge gaps and what actions can be taken to fill that gap? Over to you, Aiko. Thank you, Tom, for that uh, question. I think international and multilateral development institution has a very important uh, role to support its you know, developing uh, economies and members in filling an uh, important knowledge gap. Uh, what are those? First, um, all the person in development Asia today and tomorrow today and tomorrow I will be different from the same age cohort in the past. There's a large you know, extension of life years. Uh, there's rapid, rapidly changing uh, living arrangement, you know, family support. Uh, we also experience uh, you know, rapid technological change in all aspects of our area from employment to receiving social benefit, which also affect you know, health and social economic status of all the person. So it's really critical that the government have structure to monitor the state, the very state of all the person, uh, as Pak Maliki has mentioned, and be able to identify the critical needs to provide necessary uh, services such as health and social support. So, uh, so where, where then do we see as a critical um, knowledge gap? Um, because current data gathering uh, pretty much uh, that use technique used in developing Asia or elsewhere is that it's, it's based on uh, you know, income expenditure surveys or others health demographic survey that is based on the unit of household. But if we if we look at the household structure, yes, we would know the average income, you know, what kind of uh, you know things are spent in that household. But because of a different you know household resource allocation that does take place within household, um, there would be some inequality and difference in distribution of those uh, expenditures per household. Uh, during the conference that we're holding now, we had, for example, presentation from some country where, you know, the resource allocation, even if there is an additive a social uh, benefit given to the household, the women, older women in that household are actually not experiencing, actually experiencing a le less food consumption because of the difference in the dynamic that the social benefit brings. So this kind of, uh, you know, 
introducing additional module to bring more clarity over the household level data is something that is particularly uh, missing and that the data that can be filled with uh, you know, instruments such as Mars, that is case of Malaysia, and you know, really looking at the different element aspect of all the person's life. So we, we don't say that there's no initiative, there's Mars, there, there are a large number of uh, you know, small to medium scale uh, information collection on all the persons starting in the region. So multilateral and international uh, organization can support those government in their effort to understand and monitor the health and socioeconomic well-being of all the person by supporting this collective effort. So as, as uh, you know, Tom, you just mentioned in the beginning, ADB launched a new knowledge support and technical assistance on this area, which really helps try to support the government in implementing a panel data set series targeting older person. We're, we're now testing it in Bangladesh, Indonesia, working with NOMA on Malaysia, and to make it the international comparable questionnaire to be introduced. So, you know, we, the, the international body like us or others could really be the you know coordinator of uh, this collection and harmonization and where possible uh, will be the uh, good uh, coordinating uh, body, for example, in some of the comparative or demonstrative study that can help uh, government in their policy making process. That's it from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Aiko. Now, before we close the webinar, let me pose one question for uh, Professor Boris Supan. And I will give one minute uh, each to the uh, three panelists. Uh, I will give the question to panelists later, but let me first ask the question to Professor Supan Bo uh, Borsh Supan. The question is this, and please uh, answer it as briefly as possible. <laughs> given the, uh, given the uh, lack of harmonization and the uh, large heter heterogeneity of data, how effective is econometrics? Because you mentioned econometrics as a way of overcoming these issues associated with heterogeneity. How effective is econometrics as a tool to overcome these uh, heterogeneity issues? Over to you, Professor. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> I grew up as an econometrician, so I think econometrics can do a lot, but but, uh, and it's a big but, uh, you need to have good data first. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, it would be good if ADB uh, and other organizations really work on uh, uh, strengthening the harmonization efforts, which are already in place. Uh, so there, uh, there is already a lot of harmonization going on. I wouldn't say, wouldn't look at it so negatively as you, uh, you try to suggest, but it needs to strengthen. For example, Japan um, has uh, started uh, almost 10 years ago uh, a very good survey in Japan, uh, which now is sort of uh, holding off. Well, that is something you, you, you could work on. Uh, and obviously, the, uh, uh, the, there are many more countries uh, which should join the family. Norma is such a good example how it can be done in a relatively short time. Uh, with reasonable uh, 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 financial uh, resources. Uh. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, excellent response. Now, uh, one minute each, actually 30 seconds each to the three panelists, to the three panelists. In your opinion, what are the biggest opportunities and challenges in promoting Comparative population aging research, like the kind of research that the professor does did for Europe in the Asian region. Very quickly, we are running out of time. Uh, Bak Maliki first, one minute maximum. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Actually, uh, one thing is that uh, the, the most challenging is that on how we can uh, we can see uh, a bit uh, longer terms, longer longer terms of uh, conditions of the elderly. So this is uh, the one that uh, maybe we can also answer by our project, uh, Mr. Park, uh, to implement microsurvey targeting all the persons. Uh, 
uh, and construction the longitudinal uh, panel data series. Even, I mean, for Indonesia, we still only have like one, uh, one point, but then the challenge is on how we can uh, connect this one point into say it's like more uh, retrospective surveys uh, in, in, the, in the past, as well as on how we can also maintain the sustainability of the surveys in the future. Uh, yeah, I mean, based on maybe like existing socioeconomic survey or even like social registry that we have. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what I thought. Thank you very much, Professor Norma. Thank you, Tom. Comparative analysis will provide insights into um, how countries fare as, as uh, uh, Professor Boshupan has shown. And there are lessons that can be learned. I mean, we can learn from Japan, for instance, who are experiencing uh, um, in aging very quickly. And also governments can see the gaps in the impact of certain policies and see the, the factors behind these differentials. And I think in terms of uh, knowledge generation, employing, employing a robust methodology is, is key, I think, in generating good knowledge. And uh, we have gotten the support from the HRS, uh, University of Michigan, uh, from the United States of America. And uh, for Asia, uh, aging phenomenon is such a black box. And we, if we collectively were to generate uh, and work on this together, uh, um, this knowledge will benefit many parties. It will benefit the government, the researchers, and the scientific community. And surely it will lead to better social innovation, uh, uh, in our, especially in our response to this aging phenomenon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Norma. Uh, Aiko, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think one of the uh, key challenges is to identify a common and uh, you know, interested theme across to really you know, share the buy-in. Uh, Professor uh, Bo Supan has mentioned that social security and the change of labor force participation was something that really triggered you know, all the country to look into the issue. How does it happen? What's triggering it? So in Asia, you know, where social security and the pension system is still under development, they, they could be even... I, I'm, my my uh my hunch is that maybe you know that 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 the approach of social security might be a little bit premature but they are uh, already a good you know chunk of social challenges that is facing in this area such as the poverty of older person which dynamics are a little known among women or among vulnerable population i think living arrangement of older person which is a big concern to many countries because they are really counting on families to take care um, work and employment remains an issue because uh, there are people who would wish to work but could not work, or there are people who wish to retire but could not retire. There, there are many issues there. So I think there could be some common interest. Lastly, but the most importantly, the impact on COVID on older person is something that could be commonly observed. Maybe some heterogeneous impact, but maybe some common impact. So maybe those are some of the you know, possible, possible areas of research that uh, could uh, draw collective interest. Thank you. All excellent points, Aiko. Uh, I would like to deeply thank uh, Professor Axel and the three distinguished panelists, as well as the uh, audience for taking part in today's webinar. Before I leave, before we say goodbye, let me just briefly introduce the next upcoming Asian Impact webinar. So uh, the next Asian Impact webinar is entitled the Asian Development Outlook 2021 Update Launch. ADO is ADB's annual flagship report and it uh, is the ADB's main report on economic uh, developments. So please, be sure to join us on 22 September, 2 to 3 p.m. Manila time. Thank you, everybody, and have a great uh, afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.